You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme, phasing out government support for fossil fuels and a renewed commitment to nature, G7 environment ministers meet ahead of the leader summit in Cornwall next month. Accusations of climate crimes. We look at why Brazil's environment minister is under investigation. And creating a living laboratory in the Sussex countryside. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those coming up with the solutions. Now, climate and environment ministers from G7 countries have been meeting virtually to discuss issues including the phasing out of the use of coal and providing climate finance to developing nations. It comes ahead of the full G7 meeting in Cornwall next month and the COP26 climate summit, which will take place in Glasgow in November. Well, our science correspondent Thomas Moore is here with me. Uh, so, Thomas, what's come out of this meeting? Well, this is a meeting of the environment and climate ministers from the G7. So that's the US, Canada, UK, uh, Italy, Germany, France uh, and Japan. And together they account for 27% uh, of, of global greenhouse gas emissions. So whatever comes out of this is significant and it is really encouraging. So they've agreed to put nature and climate at the heart of their economic recovery for the pandemic. Uh, there will be a commitment to protect or conserve 30% of land and ocean by 2030 to set biodiversity targets, to, uh, to tackle global uh, deforestation, and also to come up with a financial support package for developing countries as they adapt to climate change. But perhaps most eye-catching of all are these commitments on coal, the dirtiest of all fossil fuels. Uh, and they say that uh, they will accelerate their own transition away from unabated coal, and that's coal power that doesn't have carbon capture and storage with it. Uh, and bear in mind that uh, some of these G7 countries use an enormous amount of coal. US, 27% of its power uh, still comes from, uh, from coal. Uh, and Germany and Japan switched to coal uh, after the, the Fukushima uh, nuclear accident. So for them, this is going to be a major step forward. But also, there is a commitment to uh, end the, the financial support for building coal power stations in third countries, particularly in developing nations. And Japan has been a major financer. This would leave China as the only major player in terms of global finance. So again, a hugely significant step. Thanks, Thomas. Let's take a look now at some of the day's other climate news. And thousands of students in Australia have walked out of school to protest against the government's lack of climate action. The school strike for climate campaigners want more renewable energy projects and a plan for net zero emissions. It comes as the government's announced it's investing $600 million to build a gas-fired power station in New South Wales. A plastic bag will now cost 10 pence in England and all businesses will have to charge for them. The government hopes the new cost will reduce the number of single-use bags by up to 80% in small and medium-sized shops. But environmental groups say it doesn't go far enough. They're calling for a total ban, including on Bags for Life. Campaigners are declaring a nature emergency for Sheffield. Several environmental organisations have joined together to set up a recovery group to help restore nature and wildlife across the city. They hope a team effort will protect endangered species such as otters, curly birds and hedgehogs who are threatened with extinction. And one in four drivers say they'll switch to an electric or hybrid vehicle in the next five years. That's according to energy regulator Ofgem, which is calling for better infrastructure, such as more charging points on UK roads, to encourage people to make the switch. This weekend, Ford are lending an electric car to every driver in Fordwich in Kent in a bid to convince more people to stop driving petrol and diesel cars. Wendy has been driving one of the Mustangs this morning. I firmly believe in electric cars. I believe that this is the future. My main concern is the charging points. Um, you know, will I be able to charge it at home? If not, um, how long can I drive the car before I have to charge it? Um, what is the distance that the car will actually go on a full charge? 
One of Brazil's most high-profile politicians is under investigation for what amounts to environmental crimes. Police searched the home and offices of Environment Minister Ricardo Salas this week, who's accused, along with others in his ministry, of facilitating illegal timber exports. So let's take a look at how it all started. Well, Jair Bolsonaro was elected as president of Brazil in 2018. Now, he's a controversial figure for many reasons, including comments made about women, race and homosexuality, his handling of the COVID-19 pandemic and claims that environmental policy suffocates the economy. He appointed Ricardo Salas as Environment Minister, a move heavily criticised by environmental groups. Salas has previously questioned deforestation figures, called the global warming debate innocuous and criticised a proliferation of environmental fines. Since Jair Bolsonaro and Ricardo Salas have been in their roles, deforestation rates in the Amazon have risen to record levels. Environmental groups say Salas has systematically dismantled rainforest protection programmes and overseen a surge in the destruction of the rainforest. Some experts have concluded the Brazilian Amazon is now no longer a carbon sink where the rainforest absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but has tipped into being a net emitter of CO2. And this has huge consequences for a world trying to stop global warming. Others say Brazil is doing what it can to tackle climate change. The government has committed to reaching net zero emissions by 2050 and pledged to double funding for environmental enforcement efforts. And Salis has repeatedly asked developed nations for billions of dollars to support Brazil's climate efforts. Well, let's bring in now Suli Araujo from the Brazil Climate Observatory and also the former head of Brazil's Environment Agency. Welcome to you. Uh, Ricardo Salas has denied any wrongdoing, says that the Environment Ministry has always acted reasonably. But how great are concerns more generally about the effectiveness of Brazil's rainforest protection programmes? Ricardo Salas is really an anti-minister of the environment. He criticizes all the time environmental policy, environmental legislation, environmental inspection, and the environmental agents uh, also. President Bolsonaro and the environmental minister almost daily delegitimize environmental policy with their discourses. This is really bad. Uh, Bolson President Bolsonaro gives a sign that everything can be done without respecting environmental rules. Uh, deforestation for this reason uh, uh, is, uh, has exploded uh, under Bolsonaro government. And uh, crime is related to illegal mining, invasion of public lands and the others have also increased a lot. Uh, and it's important to, to, to see that the deforestation generates 44% of greenhouse gas emissions in the Brazilian case. Thus, the explosion of deforestation in the Amazon has extremely negative climate, climatic uh, uh, effects. Jair Bolsonaro would say that he's pledged for Brazil to be carbon neutral by 2050 and has recommitted to net zero deforestation by 2030. What would you say to that then? I don't believe in that because they will not change their position. They have a, a economic, uh, they understand that economic growth demands cutting down forests. Uh, they do not incorporate the development of activities that maintain the forests, such, such as the sustainable exploitation of biodiverse resources. This is a vision for 50 years ago. In my opinion, these pro problems will continue until the end of a Bolsonaro government. Suli Araujo, thank you. It's, it was a pleasure. Now, let's take you over to our data dashboard because I want to show you the figures at the top of the screen because there you can see the percentage of electricity in Great Britain coming from fossil fuels, from renewable sources and from nuclear as well. And according to the National Grid, a new record has been set in the early hours of this morning for the share of wind power in the generation mix. Now, early indications are that between 2am and 3am, 
wind was contributing 62.5% to Britain's electricity mix. You can see renewables now accounting for 59%. The previous record for wind was 59.9% set in August last year. So perhaps some benefit coming from this wild and windy weather that we're having at the moment. Now, Kew Gardens is world famous for its beautiful glass houses and critical science and conservation work. And now its wild botanic garden, Wakehurst in Sussex, is set to be transformed into a unique living laboratory, exploring the benefits of a biodiverse British landscape. Well, one of the areas scientists will be focusing on is carbon and how trees and fungi work together to capture the greenhouse gas. Well, joining me now is Dr Justin Mote from Wakehurst, who'll be working on the landscape Ecology Programme. Uh, welcome to you. Tell us a little bit more then about this living laboratory and what you're trying to achieve from it. Well, what we're trying to do is, is use the actual gardens we have in Waker's Place uh, as essentially a lab so we can understand the interactions between trees and fungi and actually start measuring in real fine detail the carbon and the carbon uptake trees take, but also into the soil. And, and these areas are very poorly understood. Well, yes, yeah, so, so how much of your focus while you're exploring these areas is climate change? I mean, it, it's what we're looking at is, is the sort of baseline level of, of how much carbon there is in the uh, natural environment. And this is obviously used for offsetting against climate change. So it's incredibly important. And the government and people are making large investments in this area. So the understanding in this area is actually quite poor. And tell us a little bit more about the living landscape, what kind of plants are there and what else you might learn? Well, we have a whole suite of plants across Waco's Place, uh, from traditional UK woodlands to a, a botanic garden, a bit like Kew as well, but also have wetland areas. So we have a whole suite of sort of habitats where we can test where different amounts of carbon and carbon sit in that landscape. Well, Dr Justin Mode from a, a windy Wakehurst, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Now, today is Endangered Species Day, and to mark it, Wildwood Trust have shared pictures of some of the UK's iconic but endangered species. They include wildcats, beavers, red squirrels, hazel dormice and water voles. One in four wildlife species in the UK are endangered and at risk of extinction, so charities hope that learning about these animals will give them a better chance of survival. And that's it for today's show, but you can get your climate fix over the weekend with our podcast. And on this week's episode, we discuss if the technology of the future can help fight climate change now. That's on Climatecast and it's available wherever you normally get your podcast from. And on our weekly digital show, we go behind the scenes of our diplomatic editor Dominic Waghorn's report from the place known as Cancer Alley in Louisiana. That's available on Sky News social channels, our app and website. Thanks for watching and see you next week.